Elden Ring's development story begins in 2017, right after the Japanese game studio from Software was done with the last piece of DLC for Dark Souls 3. As with most from Software titles, renowned developer Hidetaka Miyazaki assumed the role of game director. He shared this position with Yu Tanimura, however, as he was also co-directing Sekiro Shadows Die Twice at the same time. Directing two games concurrently presented quite a challenge for Miyazaki, especially because he likes to be involved in pretty much every aspect of development. He's often called himself a micromanager and helps pick out the right fonts, find the perfect shape for a specific sword, make sure trees have enough branches, and he even acts out certain movements to help animators translate his vision for how a character should move. It's also worth mentioning that Miyazaki doesn't only direct from software games, he's also the representative director and president of the whole company. Therefore, it's certainly unusual for someone like Miyazaki to be as hands-on and creative as he is. But that's perhaps because he doesn't actually consider himself as part of management at the studio. Instead, he likes to be around his fellow developers to create a work relationship based on trust and compassion. The thing I prize is total openness from the staff. I try to be frank about my own mistakes. Because of my influence over these games, people are often reluctant to give their honest opinion, even when it may matter most. So I try not to let pride get involved and try to create trust. From the very beginning, Elden Ring was planned as being a more classic fantasy title as opposed to Sekiro, and while Miyazaki's development approach is very much the same for every project, there was one key difference this time around. Acclaimed fantasy author George R. R. Martin was brought on board to help shape the setting for what was about to become from software's biggest and most successful title yet. Miyazaki is a huge fan of Martin's work and refers to Fever Dream as being his personal favorite, calling it a masterpiece among vampire fantasy. While the director wanted nothing more than to team up with Martin, he fully expected to get turned down. Nonetheless, from Software's executive business director, Eiichi Nakajima reached out to Martin who, to much surprise, agreed to have a meeting to discuss the project. Shortly after, Miyazaki flew out to America and sat down with the writer to talk about Elden Ring's themes, ideas, as well as many game-related aspects. It turns out Martin was already aware of the Dark Souls franchise, which gave Miyazaki a pleasant boost during their initial conversation. The whole experience was incredibly fun and engaging according to Miyazaki, and from that moment on they both knew it was a perfect match. When dealing with narrative and from software games, the developers like to focus on implementing lots of lore for the player to naturally discover through environmental storytelling, rather than to create a linear story-driven experience. However, this way of telling a story comes with a lot of restrictions for the writer. Now that George R. R. Martin was officially involved, Miyazaki wanted to avoid this problem so that Martin was able to unleash his full creativity for Elden Ring. Therefore, he suggested Martin should write about the history and the mythology of the setting and characters, rather than the game's actual story and in-game text. Martin agreed, and both parties would routinely meet in the following months to establish the foundation of the game's world. From Software presented him with very vague and broad ideas, along with the themes they typically like to explore. Based on this, the fantasy writer started detailing the overarching mythos and came back to Miyazaki with lots of ideas. This started a back and forth between the two which felt very fresh to Miyazaki. Speaking to someone like Martin, who shares a deep affection for the fantasy genre, and to see him express the same kind of pure joy and sense of curiosity while filling in the historical events of Elden Ring was a wonderful source of stimulus for the director. One of the vague ideas the team had before Martin was involved, for example, was the concept of the Elden Ring itself, although it wasn't an actual ring at that point, and how its destruction set things in motion. Furthermore, no visual elements, like the air trees for instance, were established at that point, so all of Martin's world-building ideas simply came from talking to Miyazaki. The famous author is of course mostly familiar with writing novels and short stories, but during the development of Elden Ring, his work read more like a guide that details the setting's flow of history and the figures who appear throughout it. These backstory details were then given to the entire team, who would then interpret them in their own way and provide the visuals to build the game. The actual text you see in Elden Ring, like NPC dialogue and item descriptions, is mostly written by Miyazaki himself. Before active development even started, the studio knew they wanted Elden Ring to be their biggest title yet in terms of sheer volume. This inevitably meant taking their first shot at the open world genre. 
Miyazaki felt confident enough tackling such a daunting task now that the studio had grown over many years and garnered plenty of talented developers. To get a better understanding of the open world genre, Miyazaki studied games like The Elder Scrolls and Grand Theft Auto. He admitted in an interview with four players that no title served a specific inspiration, but he did mention how much respect he has for the design and the amount of freedom the player has in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Fumito Ueda's work, especially Shadow of the Colossus, did inspire the look and feel of the landscape in Elden Ring. Aside from video games, works like Lore of the Rings and the Eternal Champion novels had a great impact on Miyazaki's vision for Elden Ring. All that being said, however, Miyazaki mainly focused on creating his own ideal game. I don't approach it in terms of, this is the kind of open world game I want to make. It's just that the open world enriches this ideal experience I'm trying to achieve. To give some very simple examples, if I was to explore this world, I'd want a map. A proper map. Or, you know, if I saw something over there, I'd want to actually be able to go over and explore it. And I'd want to fight a dragon in an epic arena. Things like this. It's very simple stuff, but Elden Ring allows a lot of these things to become a reality for me, creating something that's very close to my ideal game. Before we move on, I'd like to talk about this video's sponsor, Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that helps men keep their hair by offering clinically proven treatments that are delivered straight to your door. To help you get started, simply go to keeps.com and answer a few quick questions to find a treatment plan tailored to your needs. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair you have, Keeps has you covered. Their network of expert medical advisors, prescribers and care specialists will select the right products for a fair price to help make sure you reach your desired hair goals. Each treatment plan also comes with a full year of unlimited messaging, so you can connect with your prescribing doctor and get expert quality care at any time from the comfort of your own home. To summarize, Keeps is all about personalized doctor-recommended treatments that help keep your hair for about half the cost of traditional pharmacy products, without ever even leaving your couch. To get 50% of your first order, go to keeps.com slash thatguyglenn or click the link in the description. That's keeps.com slash thatguyglenn. Hair loss stops with keeps. Now back to the video. It almost goes without saying that from software's previous titles, going all the way back to Kingsfield, laid the groundwork for Elden Ring's level design, RPG elements, combat-related systems, and balancing the difficulty. Unsurprisingly, Dark Souls is the one franchise the studio leaned on the most, said Miyazaki, going as far as calling Elden Ring a natural evolution of the popular trilogy. That being said, taking all the things they learned from Dark Souls and applying it to a huge open world came with its own set of unique challenges. One of the trickier obstacles was trying to stop the player from getting bored. Unlike Dark Souls, where the devs were able to craft a more controlled and linear experience, Elden Ring allows for a much greater amount of progression and reward no matter which direction a player takes. Player freedom was at the heart of the game's core design. Because of this, the team had to account for every single direction the player could take when they see that vast open world for the first time. In other words, the pacing for every possible scenario had to be perfect. For the most part, this essentially meant incorporating lots of characters, enemies and events for the player to discover throughout their adventures. Miyazaki recalls how much more difficult this was in an open world, however, versus how they did it in Dark Souls. You don't want anything to tread on the toes of anything else. You want it to all mingle and to mesh nicely with the player and their own motivations as well. But you want it to be there and you want it to provide that stimulation for progressing forward and exploring. So that was probably one of the biggest challenges. Miyazaki realized the amount of freedom and agency Elden Ring provides might be overwhelming to some players who just want to experience the main story. So From Software tried to combat this by implementing the Guidance of Grace. It points players in the direction of the next story quest in an unobtrusive way. While it's a valid option to experience the bare minimum, refusing to follow the guidance is a choice in and of itself that can feel meaningful to the player according to Miyazaki. The guidance is both visible during gameplay and on the map screen. Speaking of the map, the developers wanted exploration to feel varied and exciting, even after dozens of hours of playing. To create that sense of variation, the team developed a system where the player is either exploring a completely unknown area, or exploring a location with a better sense of what's to come. See, the map starts out with little to no detail, but as you progress through surrounding areas, you can pick up map fragments which only reveal the layout of certain chunks on the map. 
It might make it easier to decide where to go next at that point, but it doesn't take away from the fun of discovery in the game, since you don't know if there's going to be lots of enemies, a new boss, friendly NPCs, or anything else. It's certainly possible to beat Elden Ring without collecting any map fragments, but Miyazaki himself thinks it's more fun to explore with a map, which is why he and the team made it easy to collect them. While the map is definitely useful to plan where you're going next, Miyazaki felt it important to also include plenty of visual landmarks to help players find their way and to nudge them in a certain direction. The giant air trees are a good example of this. Apart from serving as landmarks, the air trees also represent the visual identity of Elden Ring and make it easy for people to instantly recognize what game they're looking at. Additionally, the giant glowing trees perfectly capture the spirit of what Miyazaki always tries to achieve with his worlds, which is beauty surrounded by darkness. Light looks more beautiful in darkness. When there is something beautiful in the middle of a wasteland, we are able to appreciate it more. One jewel doesn't look like much when you have a pile of them, but if you find one jewel in the midst of mud, it is worth so much more. Personally, a world that is happy and bright is something that just doesn't feel realistic to me. It may sound like I have a trauma or something, but I believe that the world is generally a wasteland that is not kind to us. That's just the way I see it. Although finding beauty in darkness is a common theme in From Software games, Miyazaki wanted Elden Ring to feel more mythological compared to Dark Souls. This is why the overworld and setting, called The Lands Between, is specifically designed to invoke the sense of mystery and the unknown. The starting area especially needed to feel like an invitation to this vast open world that's ripe to explore. It's therefore no coincidence that one of the first things you see as a player is a giant glowing air tree, which gives off a very mystical and ethereal presence. As a result, the game looks more vibrant with color compared to previous Souls games. Miyazaki explained they intentionally added more color to communicate that the Golden Age has passed through the lands of Elden Ring's world, and that the player can still see traces of it. The team also wanted to provide the Lands Between with a much more painterly look that better fits the high fantasy theme they were aiming for. What's more, Miyazaki thought it would be too oppressive if such a large open world was brimming with darkness the entire time. Instead, it was the perfect opportunity to show the appeal of both a light side and a darker side that's more reminiscent of what players come to expect from the studio's previous work. The mythological theme is also present within lots of the boss designs and have a heroic appearance as a result. Some might not exactly look heroic, but do have a tragic background of ones being heroic before falling from grace. This same concept was further applied to the various skills, weapons, shields and spells, which is why they all seem more godly and impressive than in previous Souls games. In the world of Elden Ring, they're meant to be used as tools for defeating mythological heroes. Curiously, Miyazaki said in an interview with Famitsu that all the armors were designed with cosplay potential in mind, although it still had to look good and make sense in the game itself, of course. When it was decided to develop an open-world game, Miyazaki knew from the start they would need a faster way of exploring the setting than just going by foot. The team prioritized ease of use and wanted something to appear when needed and disappear again when the player decides to explore back on foot. Mounting and dismounting also had to be almost seamless and feel good to use. Aside from being faster, it also needed to expand the player's options during three-dimensional movement, so it would make exploration more interesting. All these requirements culminated into the idea of designing a spectral steed called Torrent, that fits the established mythological theme and has the ability to double jump. As mentioned before, Sekiro was being developed alongside Elden Ring at From Software Studio, but it's Miyazaki's understanding that there weren't any direct influences or decisions being made based on Sekiro's development. That being said, he does believe there were some indirect inspirations taken from the game. For example, the enemy stance break mechanic is similar to Sekiro's posture system. While the mechanic initially came from wanting to add more depth to the Dark Souls-like combat, it was probably further expanded thanks to Sekiro's act of development. As some of you watching may know, Sekiro is a lot more direct in regards to its storytelling compared to previous Souls-like titles, and this is somewhat true for Elden Ring as well, according to Miyazaki. It's still a fragmented narrative mostly being put together by the player themselves, but there's a bigger focus on human elements and drama, with more straightforward NPC dialogue that's meant to help players explore the open world and find interesting locations. Lastly, Sekiro's more fast-paced reversal was also referenced when they were creating the horse mounting system. 
There is a noticeable difference when comparing Elden Ring to other open world games, and that's that there's no settlements or large cities that are populated with residents. It being their first open world title, the developers thought including populated cities was going to be too much work, and wanted to focus on their strengths instead. Despite that, the game kept increasing in scope and becoming more complex than initially planned, forcing the studio to increase the size of the team as well as outsourcing more tasks. Luckily, the team was able to explore some new procedural systems that allowed them to fill out the world in ways that didn't require people to always be hands-on and do it manually. During an interview with Games Radar, Miyazaki gave the example of creating and placing trees and vegetation. About 80% of that task was done with a procedural system, followed by artists going in and adding the finishing touches by hand. Graphical fidelity is not something from software necessarily strives towards with any of their projects, and the studio rather likes to focus on creating unique looking worlds and characters. However, the graphics department did feel more pressure than usual this time, and it was all because of Demon Souls, one of their previous games that basically started the whole Souls-like genre. The Demon's Souls remake developed by Bluepoint Games was released on PS5 in 2020 and featured impressive graphics that went well beyond from software's latest games at the time, Dark Souls 3 and Sekiro. While Miyazaki acknowledged how great it looked, it wasn't his number one priority to match what Bluepoint had achieved. He did say that the graphics team and programmers pushed a lot of new features to create the best looking game the studio has ever made. It's no secret from software likes to make more difficult experiences, or at least games where the player dies more frequently, and this stems from Miyazaki's own history playing video games. I've never been a very skilled player, I die a lot, so in my work, I want to answer the question, if death is to be more than a mark of failure, how do I give it meaning? How do I make death enjoyable? I do feel apologetic toward anyone who feels there's just too much to overcome in my games. I just want as many players as possible to experience the joy that comes from overcoming hardship. He went on to say it's not something they're thinking of abandoning anytime soon, emphasizing that creating challenging and difficult experiences is part of their identity. It's not that the studio is trying to make difficult games for the sake of making difficult games, but instead they focus on creating scenarios where players die in interesting or amusing ways. They want people to walk away with an entertaining story they can share with others. What's more, From Software tries to design their games to make the cycle of repeatedly trying to overcome these challenges enjoyable in and of itself. They want players to use their cunning, study the game, memorize what's happening and learn from their mistakes. The last thing they want is for the experience to feel unfairly punishing. With that said, From Software set out to make their most accessible game as of yet, and added multiple new ways to ease players into the experience and give them an optional edge during tougher battles. For starters, the open world this time around encourages players to explore other areas when things get too tough in a certain part of the game. They can then upgrade their gear and come back to that difficult location with newfound spirit and strength. The much bigger and open world also means players have more agency to dictate their approach on handling enemies far in the distance, making stealth a viable option for instance. There's an item called the bird's eye telescope that's meant for exactly doing that. There's also the addition of spirit summons, which provide temporary support while battling a boss or other enemies. Miyazaki is personally fond of the collection aspect that's attached to them and might give players an extra reason to explore as much as possible. A crafting system is also present, and this was implemented to let players go on for longer in the open setting without feeling too stressed about running out of items. It's for the same reason there's also more resources to recover health during your adventures, and why defeating groups of enemies recovers your flask charges. A wider selection of weapons, magic, items, and the ability to add any skill to any weapon also makes it more convenient than ever before for players to find a style of play that suits them. Lastly, they've reduced the number of hoops players have to go through to enjoy the multiplayer aspects, making summoning other players for help a more attractive option. In the beginning of 2022, once development was almost done, Miyazaki told Games Radar that he wasn't feeling well. It's not a pretty state of mind, I will tell you that. This is a tough point in the development of any game, not just Elden Ring. At this point, this is when I really start to have regrets and doubts about releasing the game into the wild and seeing what everybody thinks. I start thinking, I could've maybe done this better. I could've maybe approached this in a different way. There's a lot of these thoughts that build up just on the cusp of a game's release that are involuntary and they plague your mind a little bit as you're finishing off work on the project. 
it's a tough time and it doesn't get easier with experience. To cope with his feelings of doubts near the peak of any game project, Miyazaki likes to retreat into his office that's full of creative inspiration to surround himself with. There's also books, video games, a fridge, anything he needs for him to basically live there. He jokingly added there's no bathroom, so he does go home to take showers. On February 25th, 2022, Elden Ring was finally released after much hype and anticipation. Everyone was talking about From Software's newest title, and to say people were pleased with how the game turned out is probably understating it. With a 95 on Metacritic and reaching the number 4 spot on OpenCritic, with only Red Dead Redemption 2, Breath of the Wild and Super Mario Odyssey having a higher score, it's safe to say Elden Ring has been one of the biggest releases of 2022 so far. On top of that, almost 900,000 viewers were watching streamers play Elden Ring on Twitch within 24 hours after release. Only Lost Ark and Cyberpunk 2077 debuted with better numbers on the streaming platform. In November 2021, after it was announced that Elden Ring had been delayed from January to February 2022, publisher Namco Bandai stated in a Q&A with investors that they expected Elden Ring to sell 4 million copies within the first 5 weeks of release. Yet, after just 17 days, 12 million copies were sold worldwide. To put that into better perspective, it outsold Dark Souls 3, which sold 10 million copies in total in less than 3 weeks. The entire Dark Souls franchise has sold 27 million copies since 2020. Even compared to other open world games, Elden Ring puts up impressive numbers. Ars Technica published an article that compares sales numbers and shows how From Software's open world title sold more copies in the same time span as GTA 4, Skyrim, The Witcher 3, and Zelda Breath of the Wild. It's safe to say that the studio's first attempt at an open world game is an immense commercial and critical success. From Software's future is looking brighter than ever. Elden Ring is almost certainly a game of the year contender, and who knows how many copies it's going to sell in the next couple of months. There's also a strong suspicion that the game will receive DLC in the near future, given that data miner Lance McDonald found an abandoned coliseum that's currently inaccessible. It might hint at some sort of planned PvP update, but perhaps it's just content that was cut during development. It's worth mentioning, however, that all three Dark Souls games received similar PvP updates in the past, so all the speculation is certainly warranted. Whatever happens with Elden Ring in the future, it no doubt already made its mark on the gaming industry, and Miyazaki believes the game will have a strong influence on what they decide to develop next. Whether that means a sequel or a completely new open world game is anyone's guess for now, but fans are most likely already looking forward to it. 